Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation. My name is Timothy Price. And I'd like to tell you something about our recent attempt into the modeling of shoreward propagating accretionary waves. And this is some work I've been doing together with Yelma Korteling, who is an MC student of mine, in close collaboration with Clément Bouvier of the BRGM in Martinique, uh, and Jan Balouin of the BRGM in France, and Bruno Castel of the University of Bordeaux were also involved. Now, this work is actually part of a longer term research project, project on the dynamics of shoreward propagating accretionary waves. And with this modeling, this last step, I hope to gain some further understanding into the processes involved in the morphodynamics. So I'm happy to say I won't be saying shoreward propagating accretionary waves anymore because I'll be referring to them as spores from now on. So let's further reduce the length of the title of this talk and have a look at some observations of spores. Here we see a plan view from the Argus video monitoring station at Surface Paradise on the Gold Coast in Australia. And the white areas in this image, they correspond to areas of wave breaking and they indicate the position of the shallow sandbar below. So this particular image shows a perfect example of a crescentic sandbar with a regular longshore alternation in crossshore position. And the more onshore directed parts of the bar, these are known as horns. And from these, from these horns, spores have been observed to emerge during more energetic conditions. So here we see the crescentic sandbar and then the wave conditions change and the circles here indicate the horns or the points where the spores are actually emerging during this change in wave conditions. So once they've emerged, they usually migrate onshore under less energetic conditions. And that's what we see over here. So the spores still exist and under the, more, under the less energetic conditions, they move onshore and eventually weld with the beach. So what role do spores play in the total nearshore morphodynamics? So obviously with their onshore migration, there must be some onshore movement of sand involved as well. So in that sense, they could play a potential role in bringing sand from the subtidal part of the beach to the supratidal part of the beach. At some sites, the, uh, the volume of sand involved with the, with the spore landing onshore has been quantified and it varies from 2000 cubic meters in duck up to 30,000 cubic meters in uh, Truc Fer. So in that sense, they provide natural nourishment of the beach, localized nourishment. They could also play a role in the recovery after storms by bringing back sand from the subtidal zone up back to the beach and the dune system again. For this research into spore morphodynamics, we're particularly interested in the processes that drive spore morphodynamics during their onshore migration and how a spore affects the nearshore morphodynamics as it attaches to an inner bar or to the beach. And to study these research questions, we use a numerical model. For this purpose, we use the nonlinear morphodynamic model 2D Beach, developed at the University of Bordeaux. So it consists of four modules. We've got waves, circulation or currents, uh, sediment transport, and bed level change. So I have some detailed men details mentioned here of the model. Now this makes the, this model particularly suitable because it has an important capability of simulating the crossshore migration of sandbars and the longshore development of uh, variability at the same time. So as shown by Dubarbier et al. in 2017 in this animation on the right, this model is able of simulating a complete uh, downstate sequence of a sandbar, of the sandbar morphology. So from a initially straight or longshore uniform bar down to a fully crescentic bar that attaches to the beach. We based our modeling on field observations from Egmont aan Zee. Uh, and we used these field observations to test whether the model was capable of moving spores, uh, which we observed in the field, onshore. So here on the right, you see such a test simulation. And we initialized, it, initialized this simulation with an actual measured bathymetry from Egmont aan Zee. And we forced it with constant wave forcing. So initially, you see the outer bar here, and it has a nice shallow area, a horn. And we wanted to see if the model could migrate this horn or this spore shoreward towards the inner bar. And we were content with the result. So this um, uh, gave us trust in the model that we could do more synthetic simulations with it. We use these Egmont observations to set up our model. And for this talk, I'd like to focus on a single model run we did with an idealized spore, which we used to study the processes involved in the onshore spore migration and to study the impact this spore has on the inertial morphodynamics. So here on the right, we see three panels, uh, each indicating uh, the, the bathymetry 
and the currents, the vectors shown on top, over three time steps during this model run. So at two hours, 40 hours and 80 hours. We initially were using a longshore uniform bathymetry with an inner bar and an outer bar, also a longshore uniform. And within this domain, we placed a spore with the dimensions of 300 meters uh, alongshore, 50 meters crossshore at an offshore distance of 365 meters. And this corresponds to observations from Egmont, these observations. We use a constant forcing of one and a half meter significant wave heights, peak periods of eight seconds, an angle of wave incidence of 15 degrees, and there was no tide. So the water levels were remained constant during the run. The analysis focused on the currents and the sediment transport processes involved. So we'll be having a look at that in a moment. And we also wanted to quantify the nearshore impact that the spore had. To do this, we had a look at the rip channels that developed along the crossshore line of 160 meters at a distance of 160 meters, indicated by this dashed line in all three panels. And we also wanted to investigate the changes in volume that were coupled to the onshore movement of the spore. And to do that, we defined a, a, a different nearshore zone in between the crossshore distance of 50 meters and 250 meters. So it's a rectangular box in which we uh, 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 quantified the total volume change within this box during the simulation. This figure illustrates the uh, sediment transport contributions during the simulation. So the different columns represent, uh, here's the total sediment transport for different time steps. And here we see the three components contributing to the total sediment transport. So here we see the currents for the different time steps the wave contribution for the different time steps and the contribution to sediment transport due to gravity for the different time steps. So the time steps indicated on each row is after two hours of simulation, three, 33 hours, 67, and towards the end after 100 hours of simulation. The red colors in, the, in, each, in each panel indicate uh, uh, accumulation of sand and the blue colors indicate erosion, whereas the arrows or the vectors indicate the direction of the sediment transport. So firstly here we see an initial phase, so that's after two hours of simulation. After that in this panel we see the onshore migration of the spore and in the final two uh, rows we see the, uh, the merging of the spore with the inner bar which is uh, apparent from, from these two panels over here. So I'm not going to go into detail in every panel but I'd like to highlight some features in the currents and the sediment transport that we see. In the initial phase, so after two hours of simulation, we see an onshore directed sediment transport uh, related to all components, so in the first row over here. During the onshore migration, as the spore starts to obtain a more natural shape as opposed to the rectangular shape in the initial time steps, we see that the wave-driven components of the sediment transport drive the spore onshore. So there's erosion at the seaward side of the spore and accumulation at the landward side of the spore. The current contribution, the current contribution to the sediment transport shows a circulation around the tips of the spores and due to the slightly oblique wave incidence, so from the left, we see that a, a, a weak rip current develops at the same time on the right side of the spore, whereas there's a clear circulation current uh, visible around the left side of the spore. When the spore starts approaching the inner bar, so in the lower two rows in this figure, this is when uh, current driven sediment transport starts becoming more important in the morphodynamics of the spore. So the currents start developing, as, uh, start developing cell circulation patterns, which are coupled to uh, the development of rip channels in the inner bar as well. And the cell circulation pattern helps move the spore onshore and merge with the inner bar. So here we can still see a distinction uh, in, the, in the sediment transport, in the wave-driven sediment transport, but in the last panel it's disappeared. So this is where the currents start pushing the spore further into the inner bar, as it were, and the rip channel helps uh, uh, disperse the sand uh, along and offshore from this inner bar zone. Let's have a closer look at what influence spores have on the development of rip channels in the inner bar. To be able to make a fair comparison, we did an additional simulation uh, where we didn't uh, put the spore uh, into the initial bathymetry. Uh, 
So over here we see a figure with two subplots indicating a simulation for the, situ for the simulation with a spore and for the situation without a spore. And along the x-axis we have the alongshore dimension and along the y-axis we see time. And the colors inside the plot, they represent the depth along the, along the uh, alongshore line at a distance of 160 meters uh, cross shore. So from bottom to top, the simulation advances towards the end and blue dark colors, they represent deeper areas and yellow colors represent lighter areas. So we can see two things or two differences in these plots. And that is that for the case with the spore, that the onset of uh, rip channel development, so that's indicated by the alternation of shallow and deeper areas over here, and that the onset of this patterning um, develops at an earlier stage than it does for the simulation without spores. So here it develops after 50 hours or so, and for the situation without spores, rip start to develop after about 70 hours. And the second characteristic we can see is that for the situation without spores, that the rip channels or the rip, uh, yeah, the rip channels in the inner bar develop a more regular patterning as compared to the situation with a spore. The other thing we, we want to analyze is what impact spores have on the changes of, uh, of volumes in the nearshore zone. So the nearshore zone here was defined as the area between a crossshore distance of 50 and 250 meters. And to make a, a comparison, um, we also did two simulations, so one uh, with a spore and one without a spore, indicated in this figure over here. So the red line indicates the, the simulation without a spore, so this indicates the volume in the nearshore zone over time, and the blue line indicates the volume uh, over time for the situation with a spore. So there's two things we can conclude from this graph. That's for a situation uh, with a spore. There's a delayed increase in volume compared to the situation without a spore. So this happens more quickly. But eventually the volume starts to decrease for the no spore case, whereas the volume uh, continues to increase for the situation with a spore. So those are the two things we can conclude from this figure. What I hope you to take home from this talk is that wave nonlinearities drive the onshore migration of, of spores. And when the spores start to merge with the inner bar, then it's the currents and the uh, cell circulation that disperse the sand of the spore. The effect that spores have on nearshore morphodynamics is an earlier onset of rip current, and there's a larger uh, a volume increase um, eventually in the nearshore zone, but it happens more gradually. Thanks again for tuning into this talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have either now during the interactive session during the conference or after the conference through any other digital platform. Thank you.